Yeah. Yes, this is Edgardo Gavino from the Philippines. And uh, given the opportunity and also the privilege to share the subject that God uh, has put in my heart uh, today. Let me share with you my screen. Can, can you see it? Looks good. Yep. Yeah, it's good. Hello, Tony. Yeah. Before I share with you the topic that I have in my heart today, uh, I heard a funny story. I heard about this lady. She surprised a burglar in her kitchen late one night. She was alone and didn't have a weapon. She didn't know what she was going to do. She finally thought, I'll quote a scripture verse. She shouted at the top of her voice and said, Acts 2.38. The burglar suddenly froze in his tracks and wouldn't move. Soon the police arrived. They were amazed that a woman with no weapon could do this. They asked the burglar, what was it about the scripture that had an effect on you? He said, scripture? What scripture? I thought she said she had an ax and two caliber 38. <laughs> well, the topic that I want to share with you the, the, the subject is authentic discipleship. Let us proceed to our main text today. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 70. Let me read. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch, branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered thrown into the fire, and burn. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go 
and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is a process that is not easy to undertake. If you do not understand the true meaning of being a disciple and what it requires from you, you wouldn't make it. You will have so many struggles on the way. Let me share to you three men who express their desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, but didn't make it. And in accord that as they were going along the road, a man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Remember, I don't even own a place to lay my head, boxes of dens to live in, and birds of nests. But I, the Son of Man, has no place to lay his head. And he said to another, Become my disciple, side with my party, and accompany me. But he replied, Lord, permit me first to go and bury, await or await the death of my father. But Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back to the things behind is fit for the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. Here's my lessons. The first man, I given him a, num a name of Mr. Tukwi. Verse 57. Mr. Tikiu did not expect Jesus to have understood his intention of following him. The answer of Jesus in verse 58 discouraged the applicant. Because Jesus knew that the man's love for earthly comfort is what motivates him to express desire to follow the Lord. Let me share with you words to ponder upon. John chapter 6 verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures the light in the age to come, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Ideas to be considered. No man was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he Game, according to Calvin Coolidge. Now, let's go to man number two, Mr. Tuslo, verse 59. Mr. T.S. has a different priority. According to the commentator, the man wants to wait for his father to die first and collect his inheritance and have some security before he follows Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ wants the man to change his mind and see the importance of prioritizing the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. Let me share with you another words to ponder upon. Mark chapter eight, verses 36 and 37. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and for people's life. For what can a man give in return for his life? 
ideas to be considered. We cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. People hate change, yet it's the only thing that brings growth. There is nothing so permanent as change. Here, the third man, Mr. Too Easy, verse 61. Mr. T.E. expressed his desire to follow, but like the first two, he was able, wasn't able to follow because Mr. T.E. has his mind on his family. Christ wants a total dedication and not a half-hearted half commitment from anyone. Words to ponder upon. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. A similar statement in Matthew 10, 37 is the key to understanding this difficult command. Hatred here is actually a lesser love. Jesus was calling his disciples to cultivate such a devotion to him that their attachment to everything else, including their own lives, would seem hatred by comparison. Whoever loves father or mother than me, more than me, is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Here we see that the three aspirants were unable to make it because their heart is far from Jesus' standard of qualifying a person into becoming an authentic or genuine follower of him. The making of a true disciple is one significant mission that Jesus gave to all of his followers to do, to all of us. For without implementation, there will be no Christianity and no people who would continue the work of Christ here on the earth. Without discipleship, Christianity wouldn't exist because it is by following Jesus that the Christian faith is activated. Ideas to be considered. From Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Discipleship means adherence to Christ and because Christ is the object of that adherence, it must take the form of discipleship. An abstract Christology, a doctrinal system, a general religious, religious knowledge on the subject of grace and forgiveness of sins render discipleship superfluous. And in fact, they positively exclude any idea of discipleship, whatever, and essentially inimical or detached to the cool conception of following Christ. With an abstract idea, it is possible to enter into a relation of formal knowledge, to become into enthusiastic about it, and perhaps even to put it into practice. But it can never be followed in personal obedience. Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. It remains an abstract idea, a myth that has a place for the fatherhood of God, but omits Christ as the living son. A Christianity of that kind is nothing more or less than the end of discipleship. Unfortunately, non-discipleship Christianity dominate, dominates much of the thinking of the contemporary church. In addition to sucking the strength from the church, Christianity without discipleship caused the church to assimilate itself into culture. And sadly, 
whenever the difference between the church and culture's definition of morality ceases to exist, the church loses its power and authority. Many mainline churches depart from orthodoxy because they reject the absolute authority of the scripture. However, many evangelical churches poses an even more subtle danger by departing from the gospel that calls, that calls the believers to be disciples and follow Christ in obedience. As a result, the evangelicals accept and even encourage a two-level Christian experience in which only serious Christians pursue and practice discipleship. While grace and forgiveness is enough for everyone else, Dallas Wellard notes, we have not only been saved by grace, we have been paralyzed by it. Willard adds, adds that the church stresses who is saved and who isn't. However, when we see faith as agreement with a doctrinal test and understand grace as forgiveness of sin alone, we lose the idea that discipleship is normal. And we, and when we lose discipleship, we also lose vibrant discipleship or Christianity. Willard both defines and describes discipleship. According to him, discipleship is the relation of I stand into Jesus in order that I might take on his character. As his disciple, I am learning from him how to live my life in the kingdom as he would if he were I. The natural outcome is that my behavior is transformed increasingly. I ruthlessly and easily do the things he said and did. In other words, we can truly follow Christ without desiring to be like him. Words to ponder upon. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Be imitators of me, just I am of Christ, said Paul. Definition of terms. Disciple. A disciple from, from Greek Mathetes is a learner or follower. Usually, someone committed to a significant master. Michael Wilkins, New Testament professor of language and literature at Talbot School of Theology, further describes the term this way. Disciple is the primary term used in the Gospels to Jesus' followers and is a common referent for those known in the early church. Believers, Christians, brothers and sisters, those of the way or saints. Although each term focuses upon different aspects of the individual's relationship with Jesus and others of the faith. The term was used most frequently in this specific sense, at least 230 times in the Gospels and 28 times in the Book of Acts. Discipleship. Discipleship the widely accepted term that describes the ongoing life of the disciples also describes the broader Christian experience. Most Christians generally accept discipleship as the process of following Jesus. The word ship is added to the end of the word disciple, means the state or contained in the state of or contained in. So discipleship means 
the state of being a disciple. In fact, the term discipleship has a nice ongoing feel, a sense of journey, the idea of becoming a disciple rather than having been made a disciple. Disciple making. The term disciple making comes from the verb matete sate, which means to make disciples. Matthew 28, verse 19. Three dimensions distinguish disciple making from discipleship. A, deliverance. The first in making disciples is evangelism. We do evangelize. The part of the Great Commission that tells us to baptize them. One reason contemporary disciple making doesn't produce new disciples is that churches limit disciple making to training people who are already Christians. Instead, all disciples should be actively involved in finding, in finding others who need Christ and then through disciples gifts, opportunities and faith community introduce these individuals to the life of following Christ. B, development. Once a disciple makes a commitment to Christ, the next step is developing character and capacity. We always remember a, an idea that says the room for improvement is the biggest room in the world. This comes from teaching them to obey component of the Great Commission, verse 25. Many Christians traditionally refer to single step as discipleship. Then C, deployment. Once a disciple is trained, the final step is sending. This comes from the word go in verse 19, aspect of the Great Commission. It means deploying the disciple in mission where he lives, works, and plays. The disciple gains an awareness that he lives among lost and broken people because we are salt and light and that God's kingdom grows best organically through relationship. Deployment also includes certain cold individuals who cross cultural and geographic barriers, barriers to reach others. This too is the reason why we are given the Holy Spirit. Words to ponder upon. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I practically interpreted it as your home. And in all Judea, your neighborhood, and Samaria, nearby places, and even to the remote, remotest part of the earth, far flung area or overseas. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Note, we are all empowered to become a witness to the world we live in. Our words, our deeds, and lifestyle will serve, will serve as a testimony for people to embrace the truth that we believe in and practice. Second Corinthians 3 2. You yourselves our, are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. Spiritual formation. The term spiritual formation is derived from Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. 
my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. The word form comes from the word morphe, which means to shape. When combined with Greek prepositions, it is redeemed as it is deemed as conform in Romans 8:29 and transform in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Most accurately, spiritual formation describes the sanctification or transformation of a disciple. Words to ponder upon. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's like a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Let me share with you the advantages of being an authentic disciple based on our text today. Number one, a true disciple is connected to Jesus. Their relationship is so close. According to John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Very close connection. Number two, a true disciple is Jesus' friend. John chapter 15, verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. John chapter 15, verse 15. What is it that qualified a disciple to become Jesus' friend? The answer is in John chapter 15, verse 15, verse 14. It is obedience. Being obedient is the only key to becoming one of Jesus, of Jesus' friends. Number three, a true disciple is productive. He proliferates and multiplies. How does a disciple remain fruitful? Number one, by remaining in the vine. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We must remain in the Lord Jesus Christ through thick and thin, in order for us to become fruitful. B, by leaving out our purpose. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go in bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. What are the effects of being a prolific disciple? Let me share it with you. Number one, A, the letter A. When you are prolific, the Father is being glorified. Number two, when you are prolific, your identity becomes vivid. C. Your prayer, your prayer life becomes potent. Praise the Father. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, a true disciple is a chosen person with a particular mission or purpose. Chosen to be protected. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go in barefoot. Root that will us, said our Lord Jesus Christ. Number five, a true disciple loves his fellow disciple. This is my command, love each other. Wow, wonderful attitude that each one should be possessing with. Words to ponder upon. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men may know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Hallelujah. Number six, a true disciple is loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a love? It's a supreme kind of love. Greater love, greater love has no one than this, that he lays life for his friends. John chapter 15, verse 13. And then number seven, a true disciple lives a pure life. He is being sanctified by the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 15, 3 says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Finally, a true disciple keeps and practices the word of Jesus and is being taken care of by the Father because he is attached and connected to the source of life, even the Lord Jesus Christ. The end of my presentation. Thank you and God bless you all. Well done, Gardo. Thank you. You're welcome, Dan. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyone would like to? Oh, yes, uh, John, please. Thank you, Ricardo. That was that was really good. And, you're, uh, you're welcome, Jen. I think that the you know, John 13, 14, and 15 are a really good place to go and learn about, you know, what an authentic disciple is. Um, I was thinking about that you know, what you started off with uh, with John 15 and how Jesus is the vine and um, and his father is the uh, the vine dresser, and we are the branches, right? And <clears throat> um, yeah, I've been I've been studying the the Old Testament major prophets, and especially Isaiah, and, and I and I didn't I don't know that I really had made the connection before. You know, when you look through a bunch of the parables that Jesus tells are all about vineyards there's a, a lot about 
you know, that there's this, this farmer, this, you know, uh, vine dresser who plants a vineyard in, and in, even in Matthew, Jesus directly quotes the, the parable of the vineyard in Isaiah 5. And, and so it's interesting when you go through and you study that, um, that figure that's being used, that parable that's being used in, in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, especially, uh, that you, you can see what Jesus is doing in, in the, uh, in all these parables, including when he, he talks about that in John 15, that in, um, that what happened was God uses this, this uh, analogy of a vineyard of the people of Israel. And he says that he did all this stuff to make, to just set it up just perfectly where it would produce a lot of a great fruit. And then it ends up being uh, worthless. It doesn't produce anything but worthless grapes. And, and then later in Isaiah, so that's Isaiah 5 that talks about that. And I think it's Isaiah 27, where God talks about planting a new vineyard and that he's going to protect this one. And this one is going to produce a lot of great fruit, but any part of it that doesn't is going to be cut off and burned and, and stuff like that. It's directly what Jesus is saying. So when he says to his disciples in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the vine dresser and abide in me and you know you will live basically and if you don't you're going to you're going to be cast off he's really just talking about what isaiah said to begin with um that he is the vine that god replaced the original vine with that the original vine was israel and god basically said that's it it's only producing worthless grapes so get rid of it but i'm going to save a piece of this, a, a a root, and that, and then he brings this other vine out, and 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 it produces fruit, and and I think you know I think we underestimate how often in the New Testament it's really just telling, it's just saying the things that are in the Old Testament, and including this whole section in John, with with the exception of. Uh, where Jesus, you know, gives them a new commandment of, of uh, love one another as I have loved you, you know, self-sacrificial love, which was not a commandment under the, the law. And, and uh, I think, you know, it just, what, what stood out for me at this moment is if, if, if I want to be a good disciple of Jesus Christ, I need to really know the Old Testament. <laughs> Because I'm probably not going to understand a lot of what he's saying fully unless I do. Yeah, thank you, John. That's really wonderful. Yes, Don? Gerdo, I just wanted to thank you for the teaching. I, um, I really enjoyed it. I thought um, there were a couple of things uh, the first i really enjoyed um mr too quick mr too slow and mr too easy um you know and i think and i just think in terms of myself there's been times where i'm too quick i'm too slow and i'm too easy and uh none of those are going to produce authentic discipleship and i just thought it's it's just i i enjoyed how you brought that in because it's an easy mind peg for me to be thinking and instead of trying to remember, oh, there was this man and he came and he did this and another man. Now I can just say, oh no, you know, there was Mr. Too quick, too slow and too easy. And I'll remember that. And <laughs> I thought that I thought that was really, really good. Um, the other thing, of course, allegiance to the king is something that is just uh, has been monumental in changing my life. And um, coming to the conclusion of um, faith in Christ is actually faithfulness to Christ. And it's not that one time. And I, I like how you brought in that um, saved by grace, but paralyzed by it. Yes, yes. Ma'am. 
That that's that's profound because I think um, you know, speaking just for myself, I think for many years I lived in the mindset of I was saved by grace, but I was also paralyzed from it in the sense of it's it's so um contrary to the concept of uh saved by my faith meaning faithfulness or my allegiance to christ and i just made a note um you know we can't follow him if we don't act like him and that's just it's just so 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 elementary and yet so lost on so many christians that you know, they believed once and they, you know, they've been sold that, you know, saved by grace. I've been reading Galatians in my mornings and in Galatians three, as I'm reading, you know, it's my, as I'm reading, you know, he keeps juxtaposing the law versus grace. And, it, and my understanding of that is so different now than when I read it years ago. And, and so um, I, the last thing I wanted to say is I wrote, um, Faithfulness or allegiance to the king produces authentic discipleship. And, Amen. And I think um, that's just, it's just fundamental. It's just so elementary and yet so lost. And so we, we ask, why don't we see the power of Christ in Christianity? Why don't we see the evangelism? Why don't we see the signs, the miracles and wonders? Why don't, because we don't have authentic discipleship. We don't have authentic faithfulness. If we did, it would be earth shaking. So thank you. Appreciate it, brother. You're welcome, then. Thank you, too. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Steve and Pilis, please. Uh, hi, Edgardo. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I have been reading something uh, lately about. Uh, Jesus and how he chose his disciples and um, this whole teaching talking about discipleship has really made me focus in and look very carefully exactly on how Jesus discipled his people and that um, uh, back during his time holy men and other rabbis they were out there too Jesus was not the only one who had disciples and uh, but one of the things about a disciple first that he they were chosen that was such an honor to be chosen by a holy man or a rabbi but the goal of that disciple was to become like the one that was discipling them in character in purpose uh and how they responded to things they were to take on the persona of the one that was discipling them. And this goes back to what everybody is saying, that uh, our goal in becoming a disciple of Jesus is to become like him. And uh, one of our teachings, we were saying that's our purpose, to be transformed into the image of Christ. And sometimes it's, it's, it's easy you know, these words can flow off your lips and especially in generalities, but this is just dealing with everyday life, just like what we were talking about before when things, when we first started talking, you know, real life situations. And sometimes, you know, I'll be honest with you, I might not be able to say, oh, it's this scripture, but that scripture's in me but I might not be able to just go towards it. So sometimes I just think, can I imagine Jesus saying that? Or can I imagine Jesus telling me, yeah, you did good, Phyllis, do it again. Some things I just can't say. It. It's like what Stacy was saying and Dan was saying. <laughs> you know, if I did what I really felt like or wanted to do, can I imagine Jesus saying, good job, you did it right, you know? And sometimes it gets down to just being that basic on every situation that I have to consider things like that. It's just life. You know, this is a part of our life and it's everyday life. 
But uh, thank you, Edgardo. It's given me a lot to think about. And as we do look at Christ and try to become like him and the faithfulness that's required, not just believing that he is, but being faithful to everything that he said and that he believes. It really will um, help us develop that trust. And then once that trust continues to develop where we can count the cost, you know, we do, we have to count the cost and say, are we willing to sacrifice and then do the sacrifice? And it's a warfare. I'm not going to say it's, it's easy, but it is possible because he's given us his spirit. He's given us his support and we have one another. But thank you, Edgardo. It's, it's really a lot to think about. You're welcome, Phyllis. Thank you so much too for the input. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, we also would like to encourage our brothers and sisters around the globe uh, to continue to have this desire to join us, uh, that the Allegiance of the King Church, that orgs, uh, you can join us and uh, I'll assure you that you'll find a, a family here. God bless everyone.